Good evening. I am Dr. Ivan Vasquez, Chair of the New York State Dental Association's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. Before we start the program for this evening, I would like to introduce Dr. Jim Galati, President of the New York State Dental Association, to give, to give some opening remarks. Thank you, Ivan, and welcome, everyone. Thank you all for taking time out of your very busy schedules to attend this webinar. This DEI committee was started about a year ago, and I am humbled and amazed by how quickly they've been able to get things up and running on this important outreach program. I'd like to thank Ivan and all the members of the DEI committee on the outstanding job they have done in such a short period of time. And I'm looking forward to, with excitement and anticipation, to what this committee and NISDA can achieve working together in the future to reach out and support our diverse communities and members. You know, it's so important to hear the voices of all those that make up our profession and have them be an integral part of helping to guide our profession and NISDA forward into the future. And I look forward to what this committee will do coming forward. With that, I'll turn that back to you, Ivan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Galati. At the New York State Dental Association, we are committed to fostering an environment that is open and accepting of all individuals within the dental profession. We also encourage participation from and unity amongst all diverse groups to reassure everyone that they belong and are welcome, thus acknowledging that together we have a stronger and clearer voice. Following our commitment, the New York State Dental Association presents tonight's webinar, LGBTQ plus care for the dental team, and our speaker is Dr. Alex Barrera. Dr. Alex Barrera practices dentistry at Legacy Community Health in Houston, Texas, and is a member of various organizations, including the American Dental Association, the Hispanic Dental Association, Greater Houston Dental Association, and the Houston Equality Dental Network. He currently serves as the chair of the New Dentist Committee for the Hispanic Dental Association and president of the Houston Equality Dental Network. He participated in the ADA's Institute for Diversity and Leadership and uses his platforms to educate dental professionals on how to better treat LGBTQ plus patients. Dr. Barrera is a certified yoga teacher and uses mindfulness and meditation to help better treat patients with dental phobias. October is Hispanic Heritage Month. Dr. Barrera is an active member in the Hispanic dental community, and we are grateful for the work he does to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion across the many communities he serves. Before I hand this off to Dr. Barrera, I have a few housekeeping details to share. Feel free to submit your questions throughout the webinar. However, we will wait until the end to respond to all your questions. Also, at the end of the webinar, we will share three questions on your screen. You must submit the responses to those three questions to receive your CE credits for tonight's webinar. Without further ado, please welcome Dr. Alex Barrera. Thank you so much, Dr. Vasquez. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for the introduction. Again, my name is Dr. Alex Barrera, and I will be presenting today this evening. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started by sharing my screen, sharing our presentation today. Alrighty, so today's presentation is on LGBTQ care in dentistry. In um, as dental professionals, we are we take an oath to treat and to see all types of people uh, that walk through our door. And so I feel, believe that this is a really important um, newer category, something that we haven't really talked a lot about in recent years in, in dentistry. Um, so we're going to get started by talking a little bit about my journey and how I got started uh, becoming an advocate for the LGBTQ community. So like Dr. Vasquez said, I am a general dentist at Legacy Community Health. The uh, Legacy Community Health is in Houston, Texas, and we are a federally qualified health center. 
And we are the largest federally qualified health center in the state of Texas uh, with multiple services provided in multiple different locations throughout the greater Houston area. And I am also currently the president uh, and one of the founding members of the Houston Equality Dental Network. And this is what really helped me step foot into, into this field, into this space of advocating for the LGBTQ community. And in 2019, uh, a few of my former class, uh, classmates and friends and I got together and realized that, you know, as energetic and as excited and as willing that we were to participate in organized dentistry, we didn't really feel 100% included. We didn't feel like we're able to fully be ourselves, express ourselves, um, and bring our true selves to the world of organized dentistry. And a lot of that was because um, of the way that we identify. And so we decided to create an organization uh, called the Houston Equality Dental Network. And this was something that first started as a social group, a way for a few of us to get together um, to talk about our careers, talk about our journeys, talk about dentistry, and to really just be there to support each other. We quickly realized that this was something that held a lot more power. So with this organization, we created a executive board. We applied for nonprofit status. And we started recruiting members around the Houston area of um, dental professionals, both dentists and hygienists, who identify as LGBTQ. And so with uh, this organization, we've been able to host several continuing education courses throughout the, the past couple of years, host several professional networking events, um, and really get involved and engaged in our community as well. So this was a, an event that we had about a year ago, uh, and this is our group, right? So this, we get together every couple of months to support one another, to socialize, to share our, our stories, our successes. Um, but like I said, we also host various uh, events and courses. We have something I'm very proud of is our, um, our website, where we have a um, all of our faces and our names listed with all our professional information so that patients around the Houston community can look for us and could find a, pay, a, a provider that understands them, a provider that is compassionate and caring um, and deeply understanding of, the, of who they are. So <clears throat> these are a couple of uh, pictures of our past events. Uh, we've done speaking events at the dental school and other, with other dental organizations. We've done various community service events. Um, we volunteered with several queer organizations. And of course, we have some fun and socialize as well. And so this is really what this organization allowed me to dive deeper into this world of, of wellness, of giving back to the queer community, um, and to start to become an advocate and an educator for, for this group. So our objectives for today, um, first and foremost, we will increase your awareness, your understanding of the queer community. We'll recognize common LGBTQ terms and definitions. We will study the health disparities faced by the LGBTQ community. We'll learn about med the medical, emotional, physical changes that transgender individuals go through. And we will examine ways that we can become better ally dentists. So to start off, I wanna talk a little bit about how diversity is, is normal. How diversity is already all around us and has been in, in around us for, for thousands and thousands of years. Um, so we always, I always start off these presentations by talking about sexual and gender diversity in nature. So nature shows that sexual diversity is something normal, shows that gender fluidity is something normal. And we know this by the various species of different types of animals that exhibit gender fluidity. There are thousands of species of different types of fish that actually express this gender fluidity. Um, gender change is quite common in fish. Uh, one stimulus for this is stress in the composition of the population. Um, there are so many studies that show that if a dominant male in the mating territory dies, a female in the area will become male and replace them. So there's about 500 species of fish that we know of that express this gender diversity. Um, to continue with this, we have differences in sex development, and this is a group of rare conditions involving either genes, hormones, uh, reproductive organs, including genitals, um, that develop differently than what we would expect to see 
with normal female and male patterns that we learn of. So pretty much what this means is that there are conditions in which a person is born with reproductive or sexual anatomy that doesn't quite fit our typical definitions. And so something that you might have heard before, right? And so throughout this presentation, I want to uh, mention that I will be using a lot of terms, a lot of definitions, a lot of words and phrases that may might make you feel a little bit uncomfortable. And a big takeaway from tonight is I want you to be able to get comfortable with the feeling of being uncomfortable. Because as the world around us changes, as we try to educate ourselves to better better um, serve and feel be compassion, uh, feel compassion to our patients, we want to be okay with the feelings of being uncomfortable sometimes. And so these are previous terms that we no longer really use, right? Um, you might've heard of the term intersex. The term intersex isn't technically wrong to use. It isn't technically offensive to use, but um, a few individuals in, the, in this community have not really felt very comfortable with the term intersex. And this is because there are so many differences, um, so many ways that uh, someone can have these differences in sex development. So um, that first word, uh, hermaphrodite, is something that is offensive and something that we no longer use. Um, after that, that was replaced with intersex. And again, we're kind of in the moment right now where that is a, sort of being changed um, to our new term, differences in sex development. And there are several categories of those with differences in sex development. So these are just a couple of umbrella categories. Um, firstly, some a person can be XX intersex. So this means that they were born with, uh, or they have the XX chromosomes, right? Those chromosomes that we know to be female. However, their external genitals may appear male. The second category of DSD is XY intersex. So this is an individual that is born with XY chromosomes, but their external genitals are incompletely formed, are ambiguous, or clearly female. So again, someone that has the chromosomes of a male, of what we know to be male, but has the genitals that could be female. The other category is a true, what we call true gonadal um, intersex. And so this means that there is both ovarian and testicular tissue present. Um, this person can have either the XX chromosomes, XY chromosomes, or both. Um, and the external genitals may be ambiguous or they may appear either female or male. And lastly, we have um, the fourth category, which we call complex or under underdetermined intersex. And so this means that there are many chromosomal configurations other than what we know to be a simple the 46, right? Either XX or XY. And so there are so many different types of, uh, of variants when it comes to these different chromosomal uh, configurations that fall into this category. <clears throat> and again, a, a couple of samples that we might have learned about throughout our medical training um, Turner syndrome is a situation where we have a female missing the second X chromosome and Klein-Felter syndrome was when we have males with an extra X chromosome. And as we know today, we know that about 1.7 of the population is intersex. Um, this is a number that I believe is still a little bit um, underrepresented because you know, oftentimes, um, especially a couple of decades ago, when a child was born with ambiguous genitals, you know, unfortunately, um, intersex is something that's still pretty new in the world of, of medicine. And oftentimes, because of, of stigma, discrimination, of because of fear, um, doctors or the parents would choose what they decided that gender for that person would be. And so then what we end up seeing years later when that child goes through adolescence or becomes an adult, uh, we start seeing differences in the development of what they thought their gender was to be. And so usually this is, uh, isn't something that isn't diagnosed until adolescence. And this is just to reiterate, biological gender is non-binary because we have all these genetic ways that people are born um, that does not fit into what we know as a binary of female and male. And these are some examples, um, some of the physical traits that uh, we tend to see with these common examples that we talked about. Uh, and it's also really exciting that we're doing this today because I just found out that today's uh, Intersex Awareness Day. 
Um, so there is a, a nonprofit that that works towards advocacy, towards education, towards equality for this uh, community. Um, and they have established October 26th as the National Intersex Awareness Day. So really excited to be doing that on this day. And continuing with the fluidity, um, we see that this, gen this idea of gender fluidity, again, is not new. Um, there have been countless non-Western traditions that have had different gender roles, have had different, um, different genders um, that we, as our Western minds, kind of find a little bit difficult to understand. Uh, we've seen this um, in many North American tribes, any, many Native uh, Mexican and Central American tribes. We see this in many parts of South Asia and India, um, where there are many different types of genders that one would identify with, as well as different sexualities and different roles. Um, just to show some examples, we have the Mukche, um, which is a recognized third gender among the Zapotec people in Oaxaca. And so these are, you know, a type of people that before colonization were praised and were celebrated. And many, many different cultures had either third genders or multiple genders. Um, for many cultures, they were seen as something special, something spiritual. Um, another example being the Hirja in India. The Hirja refers to the third gender of several South Asian nations. Um, and again, uh, for a long time in the past, Hirja was actually an official third gender in India. Um, but just like India was fractured by colonization as well, so was to this Hirja community. This became something that was criminalized. So imagine, you know, something being part of your culture and your roots for thousands and thousands of years, and all of a sudden it's illegal to be who you were. Um, and Hirjas have always and still do occupy a space in the religious ancient traditions in India. <clears throat> so now we're going to get into a little bit of more deeper information. We're going to go over some terms and definitions. Um, and again, you know, a lot of these terms may be something uh, that you find obvious, something that you know very well, and other things may be something brand new. Other things may be something that you find taboo, um, difficult to talk about, but this is why we're having this conversation. This is why we created the Houston Equality Dental Network to start educating um, and start having these conversations of things that we've normally shied away from in, in the field. <clears throat> so to start off, I want to distinguish between gender and sexuality. So gender identity, um, that is the internal perception of one's own gender. So that's how you label yourself to be um, based on how much you align or don't align with what you personally understand your gender options to be. Um, the next pillar here is gender expression. And so this is the external display of someone's gender. This is uh, through a combination of clothing, grooming, demeanor, social behavior, um, and other factors. And so generally, this is made in a sense of masculinity to femininity. How masculine are you? How feminine are you? Um, and then lastly, we have sexual orientation. And sexual orientation is an individual's physical, romantic, and or emotional attraction to members of the same and or opposite sex. So this is what we know to be um, lesbian, gay, bisexual, heterosexual, these different orientations that you hear about. And so something important to distinguish is that all three of these are all completely different. All three of these do not have to align with each other. Um, someone can identify a certain way, but express their gender some uh, a different way. And, and so um, we're gonna go over some examples here so we can kind of understand this a little bit more deeply. So for example, um, if someone's gender identity was male, this person uh, has a gender expression that is what we traditionally know to be masculine. So this person just chooses to dress in mostly masculine clothing. It could be pants. It could mean a suit, a tie, right? Having a short or buzzed haircut, having facial hair. Um, and then lastly, this person can identify as a bisexual. So <clears throat> this can change, right? This can be moved around slightly. And so something, again, that this is helping us um, to become a little bit more familiar with is to understand that these are all different pillars uh, and these all these come in spectrums as well. So go ahead and continue here. Another example. So someone who may identify as male might dress in some uh, what you normally think of traditional clothing to be like dresses, skirts, uh, have 
have long hair, wear high heels, and this person can identify as gay. Again, just because someone, for example, is dressing in feminine clothing doesn't mean they are transgender necessarily. It doesn't mean that their that their gender identity um, is affected, right? So again, gender identity is separate from gender expression. Another example: someone who could identify as a transgender female. Um, dressing traditionally in feminine clothing, and they can decide their sexual orientation to be queer. And we'll talk a little bit about more what that term means. So again, going over some basic terms, starting with things that you know we might find pretty familiar, and then talking about maybe newer terms for some of us. So these first ones are pretty obvious and things that we may know, right? Uh, we have heard the term homosexual multiple times, and this essentially means that someone is attracted to members of the same sex or gender. Heterosexual is essentially the opposite. It means experiencing attraction solely or primarily to members of a different gender. And then we have our, our subcategories that we talk that we know a lot about. So in, we want to include some terms that may be a little bit new to us. Um, to be pansexual, this is a person who experiences either sexual, romantic, physical, and or spiritual attractions for members of all gender identities and expressions. So I do get the question, how is this different from bisexual? People have heard the word bisexual for quite some time. And so to be pansexual means that you, you understand and respect that there are more than one gender, right? It, it means that this person may be attracted to um, a cisgender male, someone uh, assigned male at birth, and maybe also attracted to a transgender male, someone that was assigned female at birth and is transgender. A demisexual is a person who only feels sexually attracted to someone when they have emotional bond with. Um, so this, this person can be gay, straight, bisexual, pansexual, and uh, may have any gender identity. To be asexual means to experience little or no sexual attraction to others. Um, and this is something uh, to think about also, because for a uh, long time, those that have identified as asexual have felt a little bit excluded uh, from the LGBTQIA community. Um, but they are part of us, right? They have a an orientation um, that is maybe different from uh, what we traditionally learn to be true. And to be asexual also comes in a spectrum. It doesn't mean that you never have sex. It doesn't mean that you're never in relationships. It doesn't mean that you're never uh, have attraction to another person. Um, but overall, this does mean that this person experienced little or no sexual attraction to others. And then talking about the word that we mentioned earlier, um, to be queer. So queer is an umbrella term used to describe individuals who don't identify as straight or cisgender. Um, this is a term who that in the past maybe was used as a derogatory term. And because of this, it's you know still seen as a slur to many people, to many communities. Um, and it's not entirely embraced by all members of the LGBTQ community. Um, however, you know, this is an umbrella term and this, the term queer can often be used interchangeably with LGBTQ. Um, throughout the past few years, I feel like the LGBTQ community has taken over this term once again, kind of taken it back. And personally, I feel very comfortable with the term queer. I identify as queer. I use it a lot. So I'll be using in this term for the remainder of this, of this presentation. <clears throat> Okay, so going back to kind of reiterate a couple of things that we talked about um, and getting a little bit deeper. So biological text, uh, sex, I'm sorry, is a medical term used to refer to the chromosomal, hormonal, and anatomical characteristics that are used to classify an individual either as female, male, or intersex. Now to be transgender, we will talk a lot more about this um, later throughout this presentation. Now, transgender is a gender description for someone who has either transitioned, um, or is transitioning from living as one gender to another. Um, and pretty much this is a term for anyone whose sex assigned at birth and their gender identity do not correspond in the expected way. To be intersex, we did talk about that. Um, and finally, um, the term non-binary that we might have heard quite a bit. Um, another word, another phrase that we usually use uh, interchangeably with this, uh, people use queer, people use gender queer as well. And again, this is an umbrella term for a gender identity that is neither male nor female. So these are people who identify outside of the binary as a whole. Okay, and we will talk about some offensive versus preferred terms. Um, a lot of these are more outdated terms that we just really don't use anymore. 
Um, it is strange to call someone that you know homosexual, right? It kind of um, has a connotation that you are judging um, their orientation, it has a connotation that you're labeling them to be very something that's very scientific, something that's very medical. So it is okay to use the terms that we talked about, like gay, lesbian, bisexual, and queer. We don't really use the term sexual preference anymore. That has now changed to, uh, we use sexual orientation. Um, it's not a preference to be who you truly are. We, of course, don't use the word special rights. We use equal rights. And this is true for all minority groups. <clears throat> uh, and this is a big one that we that was used pretty pretty commonly in the past, and you might still hear it being here, uh, thrown around quite a bit. Uh, we don't use sex reassignment surgery anymore. When we talk about a transgender individual um, seeking out medical surgery, for affirmation of their external gender expression. We use gender affirming surgery instead. So that you're affirming one's gender. Um, and this is something I recently added now because um, you know I've, I've read and heard um, recently that uh, this has been a little bit of an issue. So we're, we often are used to seeing the term MSM in a lot of our research, right? Um, especially the research of something that revolves around the LGBTQ community. And so MSM stands for men who have sex with men. And this is, you know, seen in a lot of research, like I said. Um, throughout the past couple of years, I've noticed some people not being very happy with this term. And that's because there are some individuals who fall into this category who might not identify with as, as, as male. So this is some, um, someone like a transgender female, for example. A transgender female may still have the genitals of a male, they may still um, have sex with men. However, because they don't identify as a female, calling them a male, I'm sorry, because they do identify as a female, call, calling them a male is, is offensive, right? So this is something that um, the, the public health research world is still kind of, kind of figuring out how to, how to word this. So this is something just to think about. And just to kind of wrap this section up, we have the gender bread person, which I really enjoy and I like to share. And this is great for, for workshops, right? Um, so this just shows how everything is a spectrum, right? From our gender identity to a gender expression, to our biological sex, to who we are attracted to. All this comes in waves, all this comes in a spectrum. And if we really think about it, if we're really truly honest with, our, with ourselves, we're all going to be somewhere, you know, around the spectrum. And so this just shows you how there's so much more to our identity, um, as we have taught a lot, uh, been taught in the past. So I want to discuss a little bit about some health, LGBTQ health disparities. So we might have heard the term heteronormativity, and this is the assumption that everyone is heterosexual. This is the assumption that heterosexuality is superior to all other sexualities. And while, you know, we can say, oh, well, I know it's not superior. I know it's not the only thing. I know it's not that not everyone is heterosexual. That's the society that we, we lived in. That is the society that our country has lived in for many, many years. And over time, this is what creates homophobia. Heteronormativity, again, the assumption that everyone is the same way, that the assumption that everyone has the same lifestyle, the same life goals, um, leads to indiv in invisibility and stigmatizing other sexualities. So gender normativity, gender roles, the assumption that individuals should identify either as a man or a woman and either be masculine or feminine, that's that heteronormativity. And this is the cause of homophobia. So in 2016, the queer community was identified as a health disparity population by the National Institute on Minority Health. And this is because they, they've seen that the queer community does have less access to health care overall. We have a higher burden of certain diseases, such as depression, anxiety, cancers, um, and HIV and AIDS. They've, um, they noticed that we have unique health challenges, such as a transgender person taking hormones. And they also emphasize the need for research within this community. <clears throat> in 2020, a survey conducted by the Center for American Progress found that one in four queer people have reported just ex experiencing some sort of discrimination throughout their lives. One in 10 queer people have reported a provider, a medical provider, outright refusing to see them based on their sexual orientation. 
When it comes to transgender individuals, three out of 10 trans people reported providers refusing to see them based on their identity. One in three trans people reported hearing a negative comments about themselves, about them at a healthcare facility by a healthcare worker. And almost 70% of queer people have reported that discrimination has somewhat negatively affected their psychological well being. So, when it comes to oral health care, um, there was a study that was done just this year. Um, so, I'm really excited to have this data to share with you all. This is something that recently added to my presentation. Um, so Care CareQuest, uh, the Institute for Oral Health, um, did a study surveying um, how comfortable dental professionals are treating queer patients. How much uh, do we know about them? And also looked into stigma, looked into access to care as well for the queer population. Um, so when it comes to being comfortable in a dental setting for queer population, um, about almost 50% uh, of LGBTQ uh, patients uh, admitted to feeling comfortable in a healthcare setting. However, out of the oral healthcare providers, um, just a fraction of them had that same um, feelings of being comfortable speaking to a queer patient. Um, it was also noticed that really, really deeply that queer individuals um, felt that they have unfair, unfair treatment in um, a dental setting for being queer. When it comes to surveying the oral health providers, that there's a big disconnect, right? Because very few of those oral health providers um, felt like they were discriminating or doing um, anything unfair towards a queer population. So what we learned from this is that there's some sort of disconnect, something that we are not quite understanding, and a gap, a space to be filled within our, our profession. Um, as of 2020, those who are LGBTQ are 77% 77, 77 more likely to report experiencing discrimination weekly, 31% more likely to say their last dental visit was over two years, and 77% more likely to, to report that they had visited an emergency department for dental pain over the last year. And this is compared to um, someone who I would identify as straight. Um, in, the 20, in 2022, in this study conducted by CareQuest, um, LGBTQ individuals were 45% more likely to feel self-conscious because of their teeth and mouth than a, a straight individual. A queer individuals were 54% more likely to report having an oral health symptom or pain in the past year. 53% reported to be uh, more likely to report having anxiety about receiving dental care. And 58% were more likely to report it would be extremely, very, or moderately difficult to get care from a dentist. So we see that there is issues when it comes to access to care, when it comes to stigma, when it comes to fear. Um, and other fears and concerns about accessing care. So this is something to um, also note. Um, there is even a more of a disconnect when we start to break up the different groups. When we start to break up those that identify as either lesbian, gay, or bisexual versus those who identify as transgender and those who li are living with HIV, there is a disconnect. And we see um, from these different questions that those who identify as transgender have a lot more fears, a lot more concerns, a lot more issues accessing overall healthcare. And that is because to live as a transgender individual, even in 2022, is still very challenging, is still very difficult to navigate their health is very difficult on top of that. And I want to talk about some top uh, health concerns within the queer populations. So overall, um, there are different health and wellness considerations. Uh, firstly, we have behavioral considerations. Um, the queer community has shown to have increased mental health conditions. So things like depression, anxiety, uh, risk of self-harm are, are all seen at a much higher rate within the queer community. There are med medical considerations as we have an increased risk of substance abuse and a higher risk of certain cancers within the queer community. We know there's sexual considerations. <clears throat> there is an increased risk of HIV, of STIs, and sexual abuse when it comes to the queer community. And of course, it's clear to understand that there are social political considerations as well when we're talking about the LGBTQ community. Um, we know that people living in areas with high prejudices or an anti-LGBTQ laws die sooner, about 12 years sooner than those living in more accepting communities. 
And going into a little bit more details, um, going over some health issues for specifically lesbian women. And so there is significantly higher risk for developing breast cancer than heterosexual women. There are, and this, a theory about this is because there's fewer full-term full -term pregnancies within lesbian women, uh, fewer mammograms are done within lesbian women, and, uh, and fewer breast exams as well. Um, so access to screening services may be really limited due to issues um, and challenges um, in lesbian women receiving culturally competent care. Traditionally, lesbians and bisexual women um, have been less likely to bear children and a result may not fully benefit from the hormones released during pregnancy and breastfeeding. Um, and these hormones are believed to protect women against certain different types of cancers. So this is interesting. This is something that we need to talk about and, and understand that this is true. So what does this mean? Does this mean that those who identify as, as lesbian uh, are those who are, are not gonna bear any children? Should they get seen more routinely? Should they take, um, you know, should we as medical providers um, have those conversations with, with our patients. Um, studies have shown that lesbian women have also been less likely to visit a doctor or a nurse for any routine screenings than heterosexual women. <clears throat> Moving on specifically for health issues for gay men. In some cases, gay men we know are at in increased uh, risk for several types of cancers. Um, this includes prostate cancers, testicular cancers, and colon cancers. Um, the gay pop male population has a higher risk for anal cancer due to an increased risk of becoming affected with things like HPV. And so the fact that those uh, are the men uh, who have sex with men are at increased risk of HIV infection has been well documented. We know about that. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, but overall, there's a higher risk of all STIs. Uh, the Gay males are also at a much higher risk to experience things like body dysmorphia and eating disorders, such as bulimia and anorexia. And when we talk about transgender individuals, we have found a link between these feminizing hormone therapies and an elevated risk for venous thromb thromboembolic diseases. Uh, there's an association between masculizing uh, hormone therapies and elevated liver enzymes, loss of bone mineral density, and increased risk for ovarian cancer within transgender men. And overall, we do understand and know that the violence against transgender people, especially transgender women of color, continues to occur weekly in the United States. Uh, and this is one of the most marginalized, one of the most vulnerable groups in the nation right now. About 60% of transgender people are victims of physical assault or abuse throughout their lifetime. And studies and surveys have shown that anywhere between 13 to 66% are victims of sexual assault at some point. So we're gonna go into a little bit more details um, on HIV and AIDS. <clears throat> so going over HIV and AIDS as an overview, um, it is estimated today that 1.2 million Americans are living with HIV and one out of eight people with HIV do not know they have it. New infections um, have declined about 8% in the United States from 2015 to 2019. Uh, an estimated 34,800 new HIV infections occurred in 2019. That was about 2,000 less than 2018. And, you know, this, was, this is progress. Um, and a lot of this progress was due to larger declines among young, gay, and bisexual men in the recent years. That has been the target group where we've seen the most um, decline. From 2015 to 2019, um, new infections among gay and bisexual men dropped about 33% overall. So this is good. <clears throat> However, um, we are still seeing that men and transgender women who have sex with men are the population that's most affected by HIV in the US. And overall, while there has been a decrease in new infections, the number of HIV infections for transgender adults and adolescents has increased. So the CDC recommends that all adults, regarding of your demographic, regarding of your sexual orientation, should be tested at least once for HIV. So living with HIV, uh, in 2019, about 65% of those living with HIV received, received um, some HIV care. 50% of those uh, living with HIV were retained in care, and about 56 were virally suppressed or undetectable. And ideally, when it comes to living with HIV, that is our goal, to be virally suppressed, to be undetectable. 
Having a suppressed or undetectable viral load protects the health of that person living with HIV. It prevents the disease from progressing. Um, <clears throat> and there's also major benefits, prevention benefit in HIV treatment. Because if a person is virally suppressed, meaning that there is no virus in their blood, um, they cannot pass on the HIV virus to another individual. <clears throat> now, um, luckily, throughout the past couple of years, something that has been very beneficial in this endemic has been HIV prevention in the form of pre-exposure prophylaxis, or PrEP. So PrEP is a medicine um, that people at risk for, for HIV take to prevent getting HIV from sex or injection drug use. When taken as prescribed, so this is once a day, PrEP is highly effective for preventing HIV. These studies shows that PrEP reduces the risk of getting HIV from sex and injection drugs uh, by about 99% when taken as prescribed. So this has been very, very beneficial in the fight against HIV progression. There are currently two medications that are approved for PrEP use. This is Truvada and Descovy. So I want you to know these, these medications. Um, in case you do get a patient um, admitting to use Truvada and Descovy, we need to know that these are, and, and understand why these, why these patients are taking these medications. <clears throat> in 2020, 24% uh, of people estimated um, to have indications for taking PrEP are prescribed PrEP. So that's great. We This number has hopefully increased since then. Um, we want to continue to increase. And we do that by spreading the word, by removing stigma of this of this prep medication. Um, I really do believe that as a, as a gay male, this is something that we should encourage all, all gay men to take, any injection drug user to take, right? This is our, our way to, to end this um, this HIV epidemic. Um, in 2021, the FDA uh, has just approved the first injectable treatment for HIV PrEP. And a Pretude is an injection drug. It's given every two months rather than a daily pill. Um, and so this is different, right? This is an important tool to help end the epidemic because, well, some people might not like the idea of getting injected. They would just rather take a pill. Um, think about more vulnerable populations, those that, like, that are homeless, right? The L LGBT homeless youth continues to be a, a major problem. Those rates continue to soar. Um, uh, sex workers, right? Those who have unstable housing, those that are incarcerated in and out of rehabilitation centers. It may be difficult for these people to take a pill every day. It may be difficult for them to remember. It may be difficult for them to have... Um, have access to water, have access somewhere they can put their pill every single day. So in these situations, something like an injection drug may be more beneficial. And I know there are current studies um, undergoing um, another drug that is an injection every six months, I believe. And I think those studies are still undergoing. Um, HPV and cancer, I'm gonna continue to talk a little bit more about this. <clears throat> so we know that the HPV um, is one of the most common sexually transmitted infections in the US. Every year, about 6 million people contract HPV, mostly through sexual contact. We know that HPV also causes several forms of cancer, including cervical cancer and anal cancer. And HPV has also been implicated in some head and neck cancers. <clears throat> so the um, HPV research has revealed that anal cancer is emerging as the most important non-AIDS defining malignancies. Despite the advent of the antiretroviral therapy that we have, the incident of HPV-related malignancies like anal cancer is not declining. So there are two different modes of prevention when it comes to, to HPV. We have primary prevention and we have secondary prevention. So primary really means educating, right? Educating regarding risks of STIs, behavioral modifications, um, and vaccination against HPV. Now then we have secondary prevention, and this is surveillance and treatment of HPV after, um, after someone uh, shows positive signs for this virus. Um, this is constant surveillance of HPV-related dysplasia prior to progression to cancer through routine exams. Vaccination against HPV has been shown to prevent infection with high-risk types of HPV and low-risk types. Uh, the Center for Disease Control recommends that HPV is a vaccine given to girls and boys between the ages 11 and 12. And this was something in the past, in 2011, 
it was first recommended for, um, or before 2011, I'm sorry, that it was uh, recommended for only young females. After 2011, the U.S. Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices expanded this recommend recommendation to include both females and males. In 2017, however, only about 32% of adolescent girls um, in the U.S. had completed the three-dose vaccine. Um, there, you know, and this is something that a decade or so ago we heard a lot of controversy about, right? We didn't want, um, a lot of people didn't like the idea of vaccinating our children for something to we know of being uh, a, a sexually transmitted disease, right? But a lot of studies have, have shown that receiving the vaccine at a young age is not linked link at all to an earlier start of sexual activity. Um, and again, um, it's ideal for girls and boys to receive the vaccine before they have sexual contact and before they have the potential risk to be exposed to HPV. Um, and again, we had know the different types of high-risk HPV. This is HPV 16 and 18, which cause about 72% of anal cancers and about 70% of cervical cancers. Um, and then we have our low-risk HPV, HPV 6 and 11, which causes the majority of genital warts. Um, so I want to, this is something that, of course, is recent uh, in all of our minds, right? Uh, monkeypox. We're going to talk a little bit about this. So monkeypox is not new, right? It is a virus that is part of the same family of viruses as uh, variola viruses, right? It's the virus, the same family of virus that causes smallpox. Um, symptoms include things like fever, chills, swollen lymph nodes, exhaustion, muscle aches, back aches, headaches, uh, and of course, respiratory systems, uh, symptoms like a sore throat, congestion. Um, the first human case of monkeypox was recorded back in 1970. So again, this is not something new. Um, and prior to the 2022 outbreak, monkeypox had been reported in people in several Central and Western African countries. And so it's important to note that monkeypox can spread to anyone through close personal and skin-to-skin -skin contact, like direct contact with a monkeypox rash, scabs, or body fluids from a person with monkeypox. Um, even touching objects, fabrics, and surfaces that have been used by someone with monkeypox and contact through respiratory secretions. And the illness typically lasts about two to four weeks. <clears throat> and we know that there's now a vaccine approved for prevention of smallpox, the Janeos vaccine, and it's also approved for prevention against monkeypox. And it's currently the primary vaccine being used uh, for the 2022 outbreak. And the reason I wanted to bring this up is because it has shown to be an LGBTQ issue. You know, we, we learned from the HIV um, epidemic that there is no, what we know now is that there's no such thing as a gay disease. Viruses do not discriminate. The 2022 monkeypox outbreak was tr originally tra traced back to two raves, two parties held in May of 2022 in Spain and Belgium. And these were during um, different pride events, right? These events were attended primarily by queer men. So in these events, this is... Um, if these raves are when there are a lot of people in very close proximity, um, there's a lot of body contact going on. And this is how that uh, 2022 outbreak skyrocketed. And so because of this, uh, it was all over the news that, you know, all the cases were seen primarily, mostly um, within men, with gay and queer men. That brought a lot of stigma, that brought a lot of discrimination, that brought a lot of notes it's very similar to the 80s with the HIV epidemic, right? Um, and so it's important to know that monkeypox is not a sexually transmitted infection. It can be transmitted se through sexual intercourse because of close contact, but it is not a sexually transmitted infection. <clears throat> Viruses do not discriminate, right? People do. And that's something that we have we witnessed um, just this, this year with uh, this new outbreak of monkeypox. Um, this is something that any person from any member of the community can get. Um, but it was something in 2020 that once again hit the LGBTQ community a little bit harsh, um, a little bit more harshly, right? Um, and throughout the outbreak, we saw a lot of homophobic leaders that have weaponized this disease as a way to depict homosexuality as dirty or as being something all about sex. Um, a lot of religious leaders, again, brought it up um, as a derogatory thing about my community. 
Um, and so from the HIV AIDS crisis in the 80s to today's monkeypox um, outbreak, we see that the queer community is still a constant target for stigma and discrimination. Um, the governments, uh, different governments have been criticized because they didn't really want to act with urgency against monkeypox. Um, after a July New York Times report surfaced that despite a vaccine supply and information coming in from Europe in June, the U.S. took a kind of wait and see approach. And this led to um, having a, a, the those in the queer community having a lot of difficulty accessing this vaccine. Um, and again, there are significant parallels between the HIV epidemic in the 80s and monkeypox and the monkeypox outbreak 40 years later. We saw similar patterns, right? We saw no guidance. We saw no best practices. We saw low access to vaccines. We saw little to no training for medical professionals on how to, um, on who best needs um, this, this vaccine. And of course, we saw stigma and discrimination. Um, something that was an issue was the CDC's language around the vaccination, because during the beginning, um, their language said that the those who should get vaccinated were men who have had multiple sex partners in the last 14 days, right? And so, first of all, this is already something that's a little bit derogatory. This um, shows the public that, again, that being gay, being queer is something all about sex. This also adds to the rhetoric that the monkeypox was an STI, a sexually transmitted infection, when it was not. Um, but also, this meant that many people who were at risk were not able to receive a vaccine or test due to not filling the requirements. Um, so I use myself as an example quite a bit during this presentation. You know, when um, I work at a federally qualified health center in what's known to be the historically uh, gay neighborhood in Houston. And so a lot of my patients are in the gay community. Most of my patients are in the gay community. Um, and as a federally qualified health center, we don't turn anyone away, um, regardless of their ability to pay, re regardless of their demographics. <clears throat> and so we see all types of individuals. I see individuals who are currently or recently incarcerated in different rehabilitation programs. Um, I see those that um, have to undergo survival sex, um, sex work, those that are sex workers. And so this me meant that I was probably somewhat at risk of monkeypox during the outbreak as Houston was a major hotspot city. However, I couldn't get the virus because I didn't I um I didn't fit around um this uh these guidelines that the CDC was putting out. Um as the guidelines started to change week by week, it still took a long time for the the vaccine to be available to anyone. And so this just led to, you know, more time, more length with more people getting infected with monkeypox. So kind of tying it all back, right? We talked a lot about different terms and definitions. We talked about a lot about different health disparities and things that are important within the queer community today. Um, and I want to talk now, narrow it down to dentistry. So why is there a focus, right? Um, I get this question all the time. Aren't all teeth the same, right? How is this different? Um, and, you know, I realized that there was a need for this when we created the Houston Equality Dental Network, primarily because of what I saw from my own experience and from my patients' experiences. Um, I know that, and I have experienced that there has been a conservative nature traditionally and in the tradition of our profession. Um, Overall, you know, there the a lot of changes that we've seen in healthcare throughout the past several years and decades. We know that a lot of these changes are a little bit sl slower moving when it comes to the dental profession. Um, when it comes to dentistry, you know, patients see it as less important than medical care. Sometimes, patients uh, see, you know, receive they. Of course, we know, right? We're practicing dentists and professionals. We know that they don't. A lot of patients don't understand the importance of taking care of their oral health and how that relates to their overall body health. Um, and we know that patients do a lot more shopping around when it comes to dentistry, dentists and finding a dental home versus finding a doctor, a physician. <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about what it means to be transgender. So we talked a little bit about gender identity versus gender expression. And so to reiterate, a transgender identity is not necessarily dependent on their external gender expression. A transgender identity does not depend on someone's physical appearance. It does not depend on any medical procedures. 
many transgender individuals are prescribed hormones to help align their bodies with their gender identity. Many undergo surgeries to help align their body with their gender identity. But hormones and surgeries are not part of every transgender person's experience. Um, and this is for many, many reasons, right? There are non-conforming individuals that might present with aspects that we know to stereotypically be either male or female, like we said earlier, right? A beard and high heels. There are individuals that may choose to present more androgynously. And overall, not everyone has access to receive hormones. Not everyone has access to undergo medical procedures. Not everyone has the ability, the access, the freedom to live and express themselves as they wish to be. That does not mean that they, they that their gender identity, that their transgender identity is not valid. So transitioning refers to the process of a transgender person changing aspects about themselves, like their appearance, their name, their pronouns, or making physical changes to their body. Um, and transition varies widely. It can, it can vary, um, it can start with appearance, dress, demeanor. Um, transition also encompasses someone's name and their pronouns. And then we have our medical transitioning, right? The hormones, the hormone blockers, different surgeries, dental cosmetics, things that make um, someone's external appearance change. And again, to reiterate, a person does not need any certain procedure, any certain surgery to validate their gender identity. Social considerations for transitioning are really important because self-acceptance and acceptance of others is a major factor in someone's transition journey. If you don't have any sort of support, transitioning is going to be very, very difficult to not impossible. Um, social and religious acceptance, depending on which uh, where this person is geographically, is highly important. And this um, is a big consideration when it comes to the way that someone chooses to transition being prepared to lose people in your life, having a fear of, of social situations, a fear of dating, financial considerations. Transitioning is very expensive. Receiving proper, um, compassionate, competent medical care while transitioning can be expensive. The Any procedures to um, change your, your external appearance, all this involves finances, right? And not everyone has access to that. Um, and of course, finding the health, the right healthcare providers can be difficult, especially for those in more rural areas. Treating the trans patients. So when it comes to dentistry, um, say you have a person that identifies as transgender and they walk into your door, right? And this may be maybe the first person that you have ever treated uh, that's a trans that's transgender, or you just want to become more familiar and more compassionately treat these patients. It's important to understand the difference between legal name and correct name. Um, now, you know, might have heard the term uh, preferred name quite a bit. We like to use the term correct name now, because just like sexual orientation is not a preference, um, someone's correct name should be what you use. Someone's name is not a preference. It's their name. Um, we want to avoid dead naming. Dead naming means to call an individual the name that they used before they transitioned, right? It might have it, the name that was given to them at birth. So oftentimes the name is um, at on their original birth certificate if they have not got that changed, uh, and their legal name if they have not got that changed. Changing their name legally is very expensive, very time consuming, and again, not everyone has access and the ability the ability to do that. Um, when it comes to pronouns. Um, we know pronouns to be either he, she, um, they, them, right? Gender nonconforming individuals might use pronouns that are outside of the binary and maybe something new to you. So something I want you to start to get comfortable asking, even though it may feel very strange, is to ask someone what their pronouns are. To ask someone, what, you can ask someone, what do you go by? What do you... Um, you know, that's, that's something that's really easy to ask if you're unsure. Ask for pronouns, ask for what you go by. It's okay to use gender neutral pronouns like they, them, right? That's very, very okay to use. And that may, I would suggest maybe start to kind of incorporate just using that generally to make that a little bit more easy for you to, to, to say, to use. Uh, when it comes to patient intake, we want to update our intake forms, our electronic health records, to have more gender choices than just male and female. Um, we want to be able to add non-binary or an empty space 
um, and also add the option for someone to not disclose their gender. Um, having patients use their correct name and acknowledging with that name is very, very important. It's going to um, just really build a lot of trust um, within your patient and yourself. And always um, something to add as well is the options for pronouns within these medical intake forms, right? Um, so this is something I want us all to look at when we go back to our offices. Do we have more choices than just male, male and female? Can we change that? Do we have options for pronouns in our forms? Um, and then we have to start considering things to ask, things that are okay to ask, things versus not to ask. Um, when it comes to dentistry, depending on what your scope of practice is, there are there may be surgeries, medical transitions that someone may have go through that is not medically necessary to, for us to know, not medically relevant for us to know. Um, as a dentist, most of the time, this is not, right? So it is good to ask, uh, instead of asking about the specific genitals that someone has, right, that you may be surprised, but some people have, and I've, I've had, you know, I've heard experiences of a dentist asking individuals what kind of genitals they had, right? Um, we don't need to know that. Um, instead of asking that, something better to ask would be like, is there anything else you'd like us to know about your, your transition to make your dental care more comfortable for you? Anything else you'd like us to know about your past medical history, about past procedures to make this, to make our, your care more safe, right? Um, oral health concerns, I should say concerns and not concerts, I apologize. Um, so within the transgender community, there is a huge access to care concern. Transgender individuals are much less likely to have seen a dentist recently or to see another one in the future. So, you know, when it comes for, to my practice personally, I, I have, you know, per se, I work with a lot of transgender individuals um, who may be homeless, who may have struggle with addiction to drug and alcohol. I maybe have to choose to be a little bit less conservative in my, in my practices, maybe say, you know, instead of watching these spots, we're, let's probably do these fillings because we may not see this individual for many, many years. They may not come back. Um, we know that uh, transgender individuals um, have increased risks of STIs and HIV, an increased risk of tobacco use, an increased risk of depression and anxiety as well. So that's something to consider uh, when treating the overall patient as a whole. Um, and in practice, so, you know, there is still very limited research when it comes to how exogenous hormones and hormone blockers um, affect individuals over time, um, especially when it comes to their oral health and the oral mucosa. But there is some research out there. And so some of the information I have is uh, from a conversation I had with a transgender endodontist who is one of my mentors, Dr. Ann Koch. Um, she is a world-renowned endodontist um, up in Pennsylvania, I believe, um, who transitioned later in life, transitioned well into a very successful career, career as an endodontist. Um, and I definitely suggest looking her up. Um, her, last name, her last name is Koch, K-O-C-K, uh, C-H, I'm sorry. Um, and she has shared with me some of the, the, the patterns and trends that she has seen uh, working with transgender individuals over time. Um, she's seen that trans men have an increased susceptibility to plaque and gingivitis and periodontitis and an increased risk for xerostomia. Um, could this be because of an increased use of tobacco? Possibly, but we do see that in trans men. Um, trans women, uh, we have seen that uh, exogenous uh, estrogen may affect TMJ issues. Um, these hormones together can lead to increased plaque sensitivity and gingivitis. So again, a lot of lack of research, but still trends that we're seeing. So closing, closing out here, what needs to change? Why, with all these, this information that we're learning, how can we put that into practice? So something also I want to talk about is, you know, there is still a lot of a lot of issues in our legislation that is very discriminatory. Um, something that I've recently learned about was the Texas Administrative Code, Rule 108.25. And this is in the, um, the, from the Texas State Dental Board. And we have a rule that says a dental health care worker who is infected with HIV or hepatitis B shall notify a prospective patient of the dental health care worker's positive status 
and also obtain the person's consent before undergoing any procedure each time a procedure is done. So Texas is the only state in the U.S. that requires um, not only disclosure to an expert panel, but also disclo this, uh, disclosure to that patient that they're treating each time that they treat the patient. So if a person is HIV positive, if the dentist is HIV positive, that means that each patient, their patients will be notified by law. They need to be notified and sign a different consent form. Now, I think that this law is very discriminatory. Um, I think this is very outdated because what do we know about being infected with HIV? If you are infected with HIV and you have proper medical care, if you're receiving routine HIV care, if you're undergoing medical treatment, we learn that it is very um, easy to become virally suppressed, to become undetectable. So the research is very clear that shows that if you are undetectable, there is zero chance of you to transmit the HIV virus, right? That's, that's part one. Part two, what do we know about HIV transmissions in a dental care setting What do we, uh, when it comes to needle pricks, right? Um, the chance of getting HIV from an individual that has a really high or an active viral HIV load in their blood is about under 0.1% uh, what the research shows through a needle prick, right? So kind of consideration number two. And then lastly, what do we know about prevention? We know about PrEP. We know about pre-exposure prophylaxis, and we also know about post-exposure prophylaxis. And so post-exposure prophylaxis is, uh, again, you know, done immediately after someone has a, um, a, a it was at risk um, of getting exposed to someone with HIV. So if someone recently had sex to some, with someone that was HIV positive, if you had a needle prick or shared a needle with someone that was HIV positive, we have post-exposure prophylaxis. So we have all these considerations that make it virtually impossible for a dentist to transmit. And of course, not to, not to even mention our sterilization practices, right? Um, so we have, you know, all these considerations and practices that make it virtually impossible for a dentist to transmit HIV to a patient. However, this law still is, is in place. And so, you know, what does this mean? This could mean that a patient finds a new dentist and they get this form, this form saying that their dentist is HIV positive uh, and signed here to be treated. That will scare a lot of patients. That will cause a lot of discrimination for this dentist, for this dentist dentists, um, career opportunities, educational opportunities. Um, and this is not right, right? So this is something that is still in practice today. And it's kind of just, uh, I'm just using this as kind of evidence that there is still things that need to be changed and worked on, not with people, not only with people's perceptions, but um, legally as well. So other ways to improve. Improving as a profession. So <clears throat> we need increased awareness and education amongst dental professionals on these topics, like CE courses, like webinars, like what we're doing this evening, um, incorporating LGBTQ topics within dental schools, very important as well. We want to create a safe space within this profession. And that was one of our biggest missions and driving forces for creating the Houston Equality Dental Network. Um, so creating things like LGBTQ inclusion in diversity and inclusion committees, right? We have a lot of our organized dentistry groups, we have these DEI committees now. Are we including queer individuals? Are we including LGBTQ dental professionals in these committees? Are we inviting them? Are we celebrating them? Are we welcoming them? Um, diversifying are any hiring boards for any um, uh, health centers, hospitals, admission boards, right? and making sure that we have non-discrimination clauses within our dental schools, within our health centers, within our organized dentistry groups. And of course, diversifying our profession overall. So, you know, just like we have a lot of pipeline programs for to help those in underserved areas achieve a career in dentistry, let's start including queer youth in these pipeline programs as well. Um, and again, diversifying organized dentistry. So encouraging diverse faces to enter organized dentistry, to enter leadership roles, to welcome LGBTQ individuals to these leadership roles and positions. Um, and circling back to our organization, that you know, leads us to our goals for this upcoming year. 
Uh, first and foremost, we're hoping to raise funds. We're now a, cert um, a non certified nonprofit, 5013C. Um, and so our goal is to raise money for more community outreach, to apply for grants, to raise funds, to start a scholarship fund for LGBTQ students and to expand nationally. We're currently working with some other, a couple of other major cities to, to expand, to expand to other major cities, to give great safe spaces for other queer dentists and hygienists around the country. Um, and we're currently working with uh, the local dental school to help include more, more LGBTQ topics into the curriculum. <clears throat> and finally, how could we, uh, improve individually? How can you, starting tomorrow, become a better ally? So no, first and foremost, it's important to recognize your privilege. Having privilege is not a bad thing. We all have some sort of privilege, some sense of privilege, whether it's because of our the color of our skin, our gender, our, our ability to walk, our ability to read, our ability to speak, our education, our careers, the ability to use our bodies correctly, right? We all have different privileges. And having these privileges is not a bad thing, but it's important that we recognize these privileges and use them for good, use them for equity. It's important to learn and to use inclusive language. So like some of the terms that we talked about, learn what it means to be pansexual. Learn what it means when someone tells you they're non-binary. And how do we use this language? How do we ask someone what their pronouns are, right? Can we um, be okay with using they, them? Can we be okay with not worrying about what sorts of genitals someone has? Finally, can, uh, next, can we create a safe space in our offices, in our educational institutions, in our organized dentistry groups, in our homes? Um, a way to do this is to, you know, celebrate Pride Month, celebrate, celebrate, recognize LGBTQ History Month. Um, you know, just how you how you decorate your office for different celebrations. Can you maybe decorate for Pride Month? Can you have some sort of of uh, community outreach that you do during Pride Month? Um, a newsletter, an article, an email blast, a post on social media, wearing a rainbow pin or a rainbow sticker. Um, voting for um, against anti-LGBTQ prejudices around your communities, right? Um, and using someone's correct pronouns, having your pronouns visible in your email signature, in your badge, in your ID badge, so that someone can see that and feel safe. Next, um, like we talked about, update our intake forms, update our electronic health records to include um, more than one gender marker, to include a space for pronouns. And finally, don't minimize someone's queerness, right? It's, um, I, I can't tell you how many times um, in my life that I've been told, oh, well, I didn't think you were gay or like, you don't look gay, kind of as a compliment. That's not a compliment. That tells me that you think my identity is better left unspoken about. Um, you have to allow someone to be 100% authentically themselves for them in order for them to thrive. So we want our profession to thrive. If we want our profession to be able to give back to the community and serve, we have to welcome all sorts of people, regardless of gender, of demographic, of, or of orientation. And lastly, these are a whole bunch of my resources. We are going to go ahead to open uh, now for questions. Um, this is my email address. So I would be more than happy to, to chat, to collaborate, to answer any questions, um, to present for your organization um, and communicate in any way. Uh, so please, please feel free to reach out to me um, and we'll go ahead and open the floor for some questions. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Barrera. So we have a couple of questions that I have here, a couple in our Q&A, and then I just have one for you here as well. How do you address the situation of a transgender adolescent whose parents are not supportive of their change or their transition? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> now, of course, that is very difficult, right? So when it comes to a transgender individual, uh, when it comes to things like dental insurance and billing, right, that's stuff that we have to do. Um, many times, um, legally, through their legal name might have not been changed, right? Uh, what is on their birth certificate, what is on their ID, what is on their health insurance may be different from their correct name. And unfortunately, that's what we have to use and go by when it comes to insurances and billing, right? 
Um, however, you can choose how you want to respond and interact and communicate with this patient. Um, we have gotten this question quite before, and we have um, a pediatric de dentist that's on our board um, with the Houston Equality Dental Network, and he's had this situation pop up several times. Um, and it's difficult, right? It's challenging because you don't want to upset the parent, of course. You don't want to lose the patient, uh, but you want to be respectful to this individual. And it's it's hard because, you know, oftentimes um, if you're a real advocate or if you want to support this young child, you want to sometimes maybe stand up to this parent. Is it your place to, to, to stand up for them or not? That's, you know, that can be very subjective, very, very difficult to, to say. Um, I would suggest that when you are one-on-one -on -one with the with the individual, refer to them in the way that they choose to be referred. You can even, you know, depending on the age of this individual, if they're more of a of a teenager, a little bit older, you can tell them that, you know what, I understand uh, your identity. I respect your identity. Whenever it's you and me, I'm going to call you by your correct name. I'm going to use your correct pronouns. Um, I, I understand what's going on with your with your family situation, and unfortunately, I uh, I'll have to talk to your parents, uh, potentially using your your dead name or potentially using the the genders that you don't identify uh, the pronouns that you don't identify with, right? So that is a really challenging question. I would say try to do your best to support that adolescent. Um, you know, we all remember what it's like to be an adolescent and everything that we're going through. Think about what it would be like to be undergoing this in crazy, incredible life change throughout the same time, how vulnerable this person, this child could be. Um, remembering that transgender adolescents are the one of the most, the, the groups that is highest at risk for self-harm and suicide, right? So what can we do as a caregiver, as a provider to support that individual while also respecting their parents' needs because this individual is under 18? Um, so that's a very tricky question, but yes, we want to try to support that young individual as much as we can. Okay, so one of the other questions we have is, are there particular things you have determined would be foundational for the local or the state or national, as in the ADA, that we could do in order to open our doors more completely to help assist our efforts to feel more comfortable and accepting in all settings? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, <clears throat> you know, oftentimes um, that goes back to especially now, you know, because now there's just so many, it feels like, and it seems that there's a lot of space for DEI. It seems like there's a lot of space for um, for welcoming all, all types of people into our profession, into our community. But sometimes it's not always there in, in the little things. So, um, you know, a while, while back, I can't really remember exactly what I was doing, but I was filling out uh, a form um, and it was for a major organized dentistry group, and there were only two gender markers, right? And so something like that. So, well, if I'm applying to a leadership role, if I'm applying to a committee, and I see this, and I don't identify as either of these gender roles, I'm going to stop. I'm going to cancel my application. I'm not going to be uh, involved or participate in this committee, in this role anymore. Um, same thing when applying to dental schools, applying to residency programs, right? Um, that is... That's a huge thing and why we might see it as something very, very minimal, something that we'll overlook, something that maybe you could say, I don't even care about, I don't even look at, that's going to stop a lot. That's a roadblock for a lot of people when it comes to things like, like scholarships, like applying to schools, um, applying for mentorship programs, pipeline programs, anything like that. Um, so that's really important. Um, <clears throat> I would say, and you having these conversations, right, something that it's just, you know, when I was in, in dental school, you know, the only time we ever, the word gay was ever mentioned was when we were talking about HIV, all right? And that's not how I want to be re remembered. And that wasn't that long ago. I graduated in, in 2017. Um, and I've heard stories from, you know, some of my other mentor dentists of, of what it was like for them during their experiences. And it was a struggle for a lot of people. And so, you know, uh, speaking quite frankly, I know multiple queer people that were in my institution when I was going through school that ended up not finishing. And, you know, when I look back at that and I think about that, you know, why was it, right? And was it, it's not, maybe not always entirely about grades, maybe not always entirely about, you know, having the, the fire or the passion, but I myself never felt completely um, 
confidence and safe to go up to a professor. Um, I never felt very like I was fully supported in the beginning because I couldn't couldn't be myself. I was afraid to be myself. I was I would wonder was this gonna affect my grade? Is it gonna affect any opportunity? Is it gonna affect how this person sees me? Um, and that's coming from someone, you know, and I went to dental school in I started dental school in 2013. Um, at, and always very, you know, involved in leadership roles as an advocate. And I still felt very, very nervous and, and, and scared and unsafe. And for other individuals, you know, I can't help but wonder is, you know, was their um, orientation, was their identity a major factor in them not feeling, feeling comfortable in the profession? So looking at little things like that, right? And so always having, remembering that it's important just how we celebrate um, Hispanic Heritage Month, just as we how we celebrate Black History Month, um, how we celebrate women in dentistry. Can we begin to celebrate queer people in dentistry as well? Can we begin to celebrate um, National Coming Out Day? Can we begin to celebrate Pride, um, National Transgender Day of Visibility? Just acknowledging that these are members of our community as well. So I just want to remind everyone, I know that we have a, in the beginning some housekeeping, we're going to have like another 10 minutes of questions, and then we're going to put up a quick poll um, with three questions, and that will um, get your CE for this program today. So we have some other great questions in here that I want to get to. Um, I just want to remind everyone about that little piece before, because I've seen a few folks kind of jump off. So, um, so the next question is, how do you handle staff in the office that are not sensitive to the pronouns? Is there a training that we can use besides this conversation we're having today? Is there something more? You know, this is being recorded, so it is an opportunity to share this with your team as well. But if there's more that can be shared, you know, I think that would be great as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is a lot of good research out there. Um, and, you know, that's something that uh, Dr. Vasquez and I we had just talked about right, right before the call started, um, how the the culture of a dental office it needs to change with everyone being on board that's the only way that the culture of a dental office will change and like any other aspects of, of culture it takes time it takes uh repetition um but it also takes compassion understanding and and, and caring to to truly make a change um to that individual for that person um so if this is a, you know, um, an isolated incident, and this is maybe one person, I would have an individual conversation with them. Um, you know, and for, and for example, um, we have a, I, my, I work for a very big health center. We have a transgender female that works with us. Um, fantastic at what they do. Really, really great part of our, our organization and has been there for many, many years, had been there long before um, that she transitioned. So a lot of people in the in the organization still call this person their dead name, and um, you know not on purpose. They understand that they're transgender. They understand that they identify as female, maybe a little bit out of habit, right? And um, so we've had to have I had to have a little bit of these these conversations, right? And even though yeah, I know this person's your friend, I know you're comfortable with them, but this is how we respectfully address them. So I think having an individual conversation um, is really important um, to have them understand that. Um, and then as far as training goes, yeah, like uh, we have this video, right? This video will be recorded. Um, there is a lot of research, um, a lot of material out there. So I would suggest um, look us up, the Houston Equality Dental Network. We often share a lot of information through our website, through our Facebook, and through our Instagram. Um, I would also um, look into OutCare Health. They're another great organization that I'm a part of that also um, does trainings um, for all types of medical staff on different uh, topics in the LGBTQ field. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I'll also add to that. Oh, sure, <laughs> um, sure. I know it's very dependent on whatever uh, medical software you have, right? But for the software that we use, we have a huge pop-up that pops up with that person's gender marker, right? So it's kind of like a huge like post-it that comes up with that chart as soon as you click a patient uh, with that with those that person's pronouns. And so even though we may see their gender marker, right? And that, what I mean by gender marker is usually the letter M or F, right? Male, M for male, F for female that you'll see in a lot of documentations. Um, that's what we call our gender marker. And unfortunately, a lot of the uh, electronic health records 
still require that and don't often have more than one choice for that. So while you have to have a certain gender marker maybe in your medical history or in your uh, EMR, you can maybe find a way to add pronouns, whether it's in parentheses behind the patient's name, um, whether it's in a pop-up alert that you can do, um, and some sort of note where it's very easily visible by your staff. Um, also, same thing with their correct name, right? For us, for example, we'll have if a patient um, has not transitioned their um, legal name, has not made that change, will have their per correct name in parentheses in all caps. And we know from us in our culture that we create in the office that that is the only name that we use when we spoke, speak to that patient. So doing things like that, making it blatantly obvious, right, what this person's um, identity and pronouns are. Great. You actually answered one of the questions I was mm -hmm. just going to follow up with, which is great. Um, one of the other questions we have is, I'm not sure why... It's a very personal question, opinion, but why do you think there's an increase in adolescents identifying as trans? Yeah, sure. that's, a, that's a great one. Um, and I think it's because it's a lot safer now. Um, I think it's a lot more accepted, especially with um, Gen Z right now. Um, I have a 15-year-old niece and I saw her Instagram and she had her, no, yeah, this is when she was 14. She had her pronouns are um, up way before that even became a little bit as normal as it is now. And I asked her, how do you know about this? Like, oh yeah, everyone does it. Everyone uses it. And I thought that was very neat. <laughs> I thought that was really cool. And, you know, the, the the next generation is a lot more open and accepting and understanding. And I think that's why there's an increase, right? There's nothing in the water that we're drinking. <laughs> um, it's just that people are more understanding. Parents are more understanding and supportive. There are more resources out there now. Um, and so, that way it's these conversations are also being being had when before if a child an adolescent would come up to a parent that they would be completely shut down right um and now these these conversations are are happening we and we see a lot more resources and and things in the media right that make it seem okay and that make it under a little bit more understandable so that's i think that's why we have the increase i can agree with you my 14 year olds same same thing mm -hmm. not yeah. the common conversation in our house um, mm -hmm. so I think there are the, the few last questions that we have in here kind of go back to topics that were discussed, um, throughout. So they're kind of off this kind of topic, but in the terms, um, I think it's testicular females, is that still used or is that considered offensive? Is that on that, you know, on that spectrum yeah. where kind of gone back and forth? Of, so know? I'm not very familiar with that term. I would assume that this is, um, a term that would fall under the, the, one of the categories of intersex that we talked about. So I'm not familiar with the term. Uh, from my understanding, it sounds like something that could be considered offensive, right? Um, so when it comes to those that identify as intersex, this is when it can become a little bit more, maybe more confusing, a little bit more challenging, right? How do I identify this person? Remember what we talked about at the beginning, that gender expression and gender identity along with um, sexual orientation, these are all different things. So um, when if you're for some reason have to refer to this person, why don't you refer to them as you know maybe the category that they're that they fall under under their intersex category, um, or just the general term of, of intersex or um, DSD, the differences in sex development. Um, so yeah, again, not not familiar with that term, but I would consider it that maybe some might consider it to be offensive. <clears throat> and then uh, the last question, also going back to one of the topics, the statistics was. Um, why would there be an increased risk of prostate cancer for gay men? Because it was mm -hmm. kind of the statistics you were sharing. Yeah, um, a couple of different reasons, right? And again, a lot of this is still really new, a little bit theoretical. We're, we're seeing trends, but we don't really know why. We don't know the why because there's a lack of research specifically targeting, uh, focusing on, on certain subgroups in the queer community, right? So that's a big thing. We don't really know a lot of the why. Some of the theories could be because um, more incidences uh, of anal sex or the habit, habit of anal sex, and that may have an effect uh, on the prostate. Other theories show um, are that, you know, gay men, again, are do feel a little bit more stigma and discrimination when seeking out health care. Therefore, they won't, um, won't go ahead and receive regular exams, right, leading to the point where um, they can get cancer that is un, undetected at an early stage. 
Um, so again, a lot of these things, a lot of the why is not known because of that lack of research. So that is what we're uh, overall where the emphasis needs to be is, is in more specific research. Perfect. Uh, those are all the questions that we have. I'm going to have Dr. Vasquez just kind of close this up and then we're going to pop that poll up for everybody to take just to answer those three questions for your CE credits this, this evening. Sure. Thank you so much, Gracia. And, and Alex Barrera, great, great presentation. And in the, in the Hispanic Heritage Month, um, you know, uh, parlance, muchas gracias and buenas noches. Thank you, Dr. Vasquez. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate you. I'm happy to be here.